is, is there such a thing as an ideal venue? And I would say, I think there is for me, and there might be for you, and there might be for another person, but there's no such thing as like a venue that's better for everybody. Right? Whatever you do in pickup, you need to cater to what your personal strengths are. So I, in particular, am a nerdy white boy who can't dance, like basically to save his life. Uh, and uh, I, I, I like to like figure things out and be meticulous and, and not make a lot of mistakes in what I do. So for me, a quiet patio type venue is much easier to work than say like a loud dance club type venue. But if I were to guess the proportion of girls that go to a quiet patio venue and get laid versus the proportion of girls that go to a loud dance club type venue and get laid, I'm going to guess that more girls are getting laid out of the loud dance club. So you could make an argument quite easily that, um, that the loud dance club is actually the better venue for game. Right? Similarly, a lot of people would argue that Vegas is an easier place to get laid than like LA or like New York or something like that. Um, whereas for me, I actually found at first Vegas was more difficult for me. Now, I've lived in Vegas for a little over a year now and I've gotten very, very good at working those particular logistics and screening and all that kind of stuff. So now I'm very good at it. Um, but it's not that it's easier or harder, it's just different, right? So for example, um, in like the Vegas has like the Sin City sort of mantra, right? It's like we came here to get laid, sex is in the air, that kind of thing. So once you're on with a girl, a lot of times the pull and the escalation will go down a bit more easily. But because of that also, a lot of times the girls are harder to open because they're screening for sex instead of screening for conversation. Also, a lot of times the girl's friends know that stigma and the girl's friends get more protective, right? So it's harder and easier all at the same time. And it's going to really come down to um, what your particular uh, style is and what your particular energy is. Uh, so what I always encourage people to do is try and think about what your strengths are. What are you best at? And you kind of know this, right? Are you better at talking or better at getting physical? Are you better at being like logical and like having your life together or are you better at being crazy and fun? Right? Think about these things and work to your own advantage. Don't try and be a poor man's version of somebody else. You are who you are. You have, uh, I'm guessing for this room, anywhere between 18 and maybe 40 some years of life experience and history guiding you towards being a particular person to try and change all that to follow somebody else's style of game, to follow somebody else's like way of being is not going to work very well for you. So first and foremost, you need to be whatever your best self is, okay? So you need to think about that. However, you also need to get better at the things you suck at, right? So what I usually recommend to people is spend about like maybe 80% of the time doing what you're good at. If you're good at loud dance floor game, go to loud dance floors 80% of the time, and then 20% of the time, go to some quiet patio somewhere, make yourself work, make yourself suck for a little bit, make yourself struggle and, and, and have a tough night, and learn from that. <clears throat> but cater to where you're best at. So is there such a thing as an ideal venue? Depends who you are. Depends who you are. For me, my ideal venue is this. My ideal venue, and this is like, like when this happens, I like, I'm, I'm not religious at all, but like I like cross myself not being religious. This is how lucky I feel it is, all right? If I see like a 10 sitting by herself in the daytime, that to me is like, it's, it's like the, the, the gods have smiled upon me, right? Um, actually like the ideal, ideal scenario, um, I remember one of, the, one of the hottest girls I ever dated. Uh, I met her, I was doing improvisational comedy class actually in Hollywood, and I got to class uh, like five minutes early, and I was like the, the second one to show up. The first one was a girl that had been in Playboy. Um, and so she's just sitting there, like waiting for the class to start with nothing to do, and we have a common interest, right? So um, easiest conversation to start in the world, easiest flirtation, and then once we get into the class, because I, I kind of know social dynamics, and I also fortunately was, I, I was retaking this level of improv, so I already kind of knew a lot of this stuff, and so I could kind of stand out. I was able to like social proof the room and get other girls interested in me. It was just like fish in a barrel. It was the most amazing thing ever. Um, that's the ideal scenario. The ideal scenario is captive audience, no friends, no bullshit, and like an easy open. That's for me. Right? Now, a lot of other guys, that wouldn't be though. A lot of guys who are not as verbal, they would prefer like the loud, crazy dance club, or they'd prefer a girl that gives them shit tests. I know a guy who actually did very well with girls. He was actually an instructor for RSD many years ago, and he could not game a girl that was nice to him. It was impossible. If the girl was nice, 
he could not game her. The way that he gamed was by getting shit tests and just blowing through shit tests by being extremely assertive and extremely authoritative. That was his entire game, okay? And so he would go in, and if the girl was nice, he would just do anything and everything to provoke a shit test, right? He was extremely rude, right? He'd do, he, the, my favorite thing that he'd do is he'd be like this all the time, hey, hey, you, focus, hey, what's up, right? Just like fucking like really, really on. He'd also be, um, so anytime he lost his atten their attention, he'd do that. The other thing is he'd be very, very like um, mean and even rude with the questions he would ask. Right? He'd be like, hey, you, what's your name? Mandy. There's a lot of hesitation there. You forgot your name? <laughs> no, the phone went off. Oh, really? You can't focus, huh? No, I can focus. It's because you think I'm too hot? <laughs> <laughs> why are you la no, why are you laughing? That was a serious question. Are you intimidated by me? No. Really? Yeah. Your eyes don't lie, girl. <laughs> right? It's just like, I mean, like, it's just like pound on them, right? And one of two things will happen. Either their frame will snap and they'll start giggling and giving in, or they'll start shit testing them. One or the other. And by just being that powerful frame, he could actually get results. It was funny because um, he had a theory that the best way to get laid was actually to follow him around and open any girl that he had just talked to and failed with. <laughs> because by the, by the time he had failed and the way that he had failed, that girl would be so emotionally distraught and so like confused that you just walk in and just be like, hi. And she'd be like, please come somewhere with me and do something with, like please validate me in some way. Um, and he was actually kind of right about that. Um, but that's another particular style of game. And that's the complete opposite. So for him, what would he prefer? He'd prefer a loud, intense environment. In fact, he'd prefer a situation where some girl gets in his face and screams at him. And he'll just like, shout her down until she flinches first. Right? Completely different style of game. Works better uh, for him. All right? Take another guy that's kind of similar to that in a way. Is, is what's that? Does he, get, does he get beat up at clubs? Like, no, no. Surpri surprisingly not, no. I don't know. He's, he's, he's had some incidents, but like surprisingly little. Um, another guy who's really interesting in that regard is a guy like, say, Derek of, you know, R RSD fame. Um, I was on a boot camp with him last weekend in New York. I was teaching with him. And his style of game is incredibly, incredibly polarizing as well. So uh, one, one set I remember in particular, he was talking to this tall, like, Ukrainian model. And... Um, He's just like doing these very, very, very offensive things, right? So he's like, girl, what'd you do back in Ukraine? Were you in the sex trades? <laughs> right? Like completely deadpan. She's like, what? He's like, do you sell your body for sex to come over here? <laughs> right? Like, it's pretty fucking polarizing. Could the girl get offended by this? Hell yes. Right? But she didn't. She actually enjoyed it. She actually liked it in this particular case. Right? And he actually didn't break the frame. He actually continued. He hit on it like three times until she like had to crack. Um, the other thing that he does really well is he does these extreme offensive misinterpretations, right? So I, I, I can't vouch for the politics on this, so I honestly don't watch the news that much. But um, he's saying like, oh, you from Ukraine? Are you, are you a Putin supporter? Do you like do you support like Putin? This and that. And I, I don't know I don't know how offensive or whatever how that is. But she seemed to be like pretty offended by it. Um, and she's like, no, if I had a gun, I would kill Putin. That's a terrible accent. <laughs> um, and he's like, oh, he gave you gonorrhea and it almost killed you? <laughs> right? Just these things are completely off the wall, but again, designed to be instigating and designed to be offensive. Okay? And why is that actually important with a really hot girl? Why is that important with a hot girl? It's because hot girls usually don't give you much. Hot girls give you this blank sort of like non-reactiveness that I call the blasé, and that, that's what makes them actually hard to game. Right? It's because their frame is, is very strong, and you're not, necessarily, like, um, you're not necessarily getting into it or getting under their skin, just having done a cold approach. Right? If you approach a girl that's like, let's say, let's say like, I don't know what I am as a guy. Let's say on looks I'm like a seven maybe. That's, I think that's fair. I don't think I'm like massively unattractive, but I don't think I'm like, you know, that good looking either. Something like that. Right? So if I walk up to a girl that's like a six, if I walk up and I say hi in like a confident way, she'll probably be flattered that I talk to her and she'll probably be very positive, right? If I walk up to a girl that's like a four, she'll probably think I'm fucking with her and she doesn't deserve me and she'll actually probably give me shit for that, right? She'll probably just think, you know, this is another mean, cool kid like fucking with me, right? <laughs> it's true. It's true because, oh, well, why would I be talking to her? It doesn't make sense, right? But say like a girl like a six, she'll be very, very flattered, very, very happy. A girl that's like a seven or an eight, I go in and I'm pretty confident, but I'm, you know, portraying myself, you know, seven, eight, maybe myself, she'll test me. She'll be like, is this guy what he claims to be? 
is this guy the real deal? Do I believe it? And if I pass her shit test and if she believes it, then she'll get attracted to me. And the nine or the 10, oftentimes I won't show up on her radar. I'll go in, I'll be like, hey, what's up, I'm Todd. She'll be like, oh, nice to meet you. And then, you know, one of these. <laughs> mm-hmm, yeah, cool, right? And she'll give you the blase. Why? It's because you have not resonated on her, on her radar, right? It's not your fault. I mean, it could be your fault. If you did a shitty approach, it's your fault, right? But you could do a good approach and still not necessarily show up on the radar. And why is that? It's because a lot of times these really hot girls have a lot of really good opportunities, right? Sorry to tell you, hot girls date cool guys. It happens, right? They date guys that are celebrities, athletes, movie stars, uh, like CEOs of companies. Right? Or just natural cool guys that have been with hundreds of women and are crazy, crazy fun, who are probably like 10 times funnier than any of us in this room. Right? It's true. That's who these girls can date. And oftentimes, the way that they date these guys is not by the guys going and picking them up, because those types of guys have a lot of girls in their life, and most of them don't do cold approach pickup. Most of them just have girls in their life because girls have always been chasing them. Right? Some of them do do cold approach on top of it, and those guys are really fucking cool, but a lot of them don't. Right? So it's a different paradigm, and the very fact that you walked up, you're automatically not quite in that same paradigm as the guy who she Googled and stalked and like, tried to go backstage to his concert or something like that. Right? She put more effort in there. It's coming from a different frame. So in this case, you have to do something to get on her radar. And what you need to do on her, to get on her radar is you have to instigate in some way. Okay? And that brings me to um, a new concept. This concept actually is uh, kind of come out on my, my video this week, interestingly enough. Um, but the concept is, where do shit tests come from? Right? Where do shit tests come from? What creates shit tests? And yeah, we all know kind of intuitively. We all kind of intuitively know that a shit test is, um, she's checking to see if your frame is, is what you believe it is. Right? You, you're coming and saying to her, hey, I'm a cool guy, we should meet. Right? And she's checking to see if you believe that, and then secondly, if she believes that. We get that. We also kind of know that if you're too low value, you don't even get a shit test. So for example, if a five-year-old girl walked up to like a Victoria's Secret model and was like, you're kind of not pretty, she'd be like, oh, you silly little, little boy, right? Because he's not a valid sexual threat. He's not a valid sexual prospect, so it doesn't register. Also, she's highly, highly validated in that particular area of her life, so she knows, at least to a minimum threshold, she definitely is pretty, right? So it doesn't really register. But if some guy who she was pining over said that same thing to her, it might devastate her. She might break down in tears, she might start crying, she might just fall apart, right? Because he's now relevant. Um, so the secret is to make yourself relevant. But the question is, what is relevant? What makes you relevant to a girl? And the answer is, you need to be either perceived as value or perceived of as a threat, right? That's what we notice in the world. What is value or what is a threat? Look at evolution. If we're on the savanna and we see an animal we can eat, we think value and we notice that animal. If we're on the savanna and we see an animal that can eat us, we think I better get the fuck out of here before it eats me. And that threat makes us notice it. Okay, so that's what we notice on a deep primal level is that which is value or that which is threat to us. And then what this really comes down to for a girl, the biggest threat to a girl socially, um, other than like being embarrassed publicly, like obviously that's, that's a social threat as well, but in, within a one-on-one -on -one conversation, the biggest threat to a girl socially is a threat to her frame, a threat to her personal belief system, right? So a girl has this, this personal belief system of, uh, like a hot girl in a club has a belief system of, I'm a hot girl in a club, I'm wearing a cool dress, I'm gonna get fed like drinks by guys, I'm gonna dance around and party, and I'm the shit. <clears throat> and you go in and you say, hi, you would be better off if you were in my world. Right? And that's not literally what you're saying. That's not the opener I'm suggesting you use. Right? That'd be an interesting one. Go try it, I guess. But like, everything must be field tested. But um, you're saying that inherently in your frame. You're saying, hi, you're lucky to be talking to me. Now there's this disconnect. Right? There is this disconnect where you're saying one thing, she's saying another thing. And that could potentially threaten her frame. Right? And if you are particularly insulting about it, particularly confident with it, particularly loud with it, it's more likely to threaten her frame and to become um, something that can actually elicit a shit test and actually elicit a conversation that will create emotional arousal. I'll take questions at, more at the end, um, possibly. Um, okay, so that gives you more of a chance of having that occur. But then the question comes down to, 
how do I become more dominant? How do you become more dominant? Well, there's a few things. Obvious things are speak in a louder voice. Right? Obviously, if you speak in a louder voice, you're more dominant. Get physical, more dominant. Cut space and get close, that's more dominant. Um, here, do, you want, do me a favor and stand up real fast. I won't put you on camera, I promise. Um, okay, so turn, turn, turn. Okay. Turn. Okay, so if I'm having a conversation with him and we're conversing like this, how man's woman is this conversation? Not very. This is what I call the invitation to the world. This is the invitation that says, come talk to my girl, please. Okay? <laughs> and lots of guys will oblige you on that. Right? The guys will become like sharks when there's blood in the water. They'll be like, oh, this guy who's not masculine enough to like actually look the girl in the eye is talking to this hot girl. I could talk to her too. And then they'll just come out of the woodwork and they'll join your set and it will suck. Right? And you'll just get amogged left and right and it's shitty. Right? On the other hand, if it's like this, this is not a set that looks friendly to come into. Right? It doesn't look like invitation. Right? It also has, thank you, potential to get serious and be man to woman and go somewhere. Okay? Um, so that's another way to be dominant, is to cut space, um, have eye contact, that kind of stuff. The other thing is your tonality. Right? We know breaking rapport tonality, saying things like a command. Um, I'm going to try and do trying for rapport tonality right after that, which would be hard. Um, not like a question. Not like everything you're not sure of. Right? If your voice goes up at the end like a question, you sound insecure, you sound needy, you sound like you don't have any authority. Right? So that's another thing is your tonality. But the best way to get all of these things is through your inner game. The best way to get all of these things is to have the right belief system. A uh, quick story about the education of game. In about, I think year like 2001 maybe, 2002, Tyler put out this post on the old like seduction forums. It's called the 25 points. It was the 25 things that he sees guys do over and over and over again that fuck them up with girls. Right, the 25 behaviors that keep you from getting laid. And it was brilliant. It was one of the most brilliant pieces of pickup theory that's ever been written. It was totally accurate, totally on point. Um, we got him like massive plaudits in the pickup community, and it was so right. And so we went out and we started teaching based on that. We'd take guys out on boot camp, we'd say, here's 25 things, don't do these 25 things. Right? And there were things like, you know, um, it's like good is stand with your feet like a half a meter apart, bad is like stand like this and don't take up space and look needy, right? Things like that. Or um, good is talking in, in a nice loud tone of voice. Um, good is like be relaxed in your shoulders as opposed to like being like all like tense and like dinosaur arms, right? Things like that, right? Because guys do all these different things. Um, good is st either stand up firmly or sit down with a girl instead of like squatting in front of her, right? So many guys, I have no idea why guys do this, but like they'll go talk to a girl here and like, Hey, so how are you doing, right? <laughs> and like, granted I've been in the gym all week, but like I can only hold this position for like 30 seconds. Like that's, that's not comfortable, but guys do it. So it's stuff like that, stuff that's, that's obviously right. You can't really even dispute it. We'd teach these guys this. We'd send them out on boot camp, say don't do any of these things. And what would happen is they'd start thinking about their body language, thinking about what they're doing, get nervous and insecure in their heads, and they do all of the 25 wrong without fail. Right? Because they were thinking about it and becoming insecure. Um, after a few years of this failing miserably, we decided this wasn't working very well, and we took a different approach. And that approach was, instead of trying to look at the symptoms, we looked at the root cause. And what is the root cause of all these behaviors? Insecurity. Not being confident. Right? So instead, we worked on confidence, um, we call like offering value, bringing the party, being in a good mood, and we didn't even talk about the 25 points anymore. And we're like, okay, fuck, teaching the 25 points isn't working. We're just scrapping that. We're going to teach a different way. And then funny enough, as soon as we did that, we started teaching the inner game stuff. All of a sudden, the 25 points disappeared. The guys would go out, and they would have amazing body language. And they'd be cool, and they'd be confident. And they'd stop doing all the bad behaviors. And even funnier, when they actually did do the bad behaviors, suddenly the bad behaviors wouldn't even be bad anymore. Like they'd do something wrong and still get the result because their overall vibe would power through it. Okay? So you can look at behaviors to like be more dominant or be more like pick up correct or have better body language. And that's all great and it's good to understand it. But the real way to fix it is not by fixing the symptoms, it's by fixing the underlying cause. Okay? And here's a general principle for you. Whenever you want to fix something outer game, i.e. body language or manner of speech or lines that are coming out of your mouth, Usually the best way to fix it is with inner game. 
And when we want to fix something in our game, not always, but oftentimes, a good way to fix it is with outer game. Okay? Um, another way of looking at it is if you're trying to cu like cure something action, maybe cure it in your head. If you're trying to cure something in your head, cure it through action. Okay, I'll give you some examples of this. Um, say that you are what we call like out of state or in your head. You, you know, maybe you took a bad blowout, all of a sudden you're thinking about yourself, you're wondering if like the venue is too tough for you or if everybody here knows each other and everybody's with their boyfriend and um, if, if like you have some like weird stain on your shirt or you know, you don't, you don't know what's going on, you're getting all in your head, right? If your tonality is off. The more that you think about that, the more you think about being in your head, you're putting yourself further in your head. Because really what being in your head is, it's being out of the present moment. Okay? Being in your head means you're thinking about the past or thinking about the future. It is impossible to be in your head when you're thinking about this exact present moment. Because right? you can't judge this moment. You're too busy experiencing this moment to judge it. Right? But the past you can judge, and the future you can imagine in bad ways and judge. But the present moment you can't judge. So the key to getting out of your head is not to try and like psychoanalyze yourself and like do this like weird like like puzzle in your head and like twist all your all your synapses. What it is is take an action that brings you back to the moment. Okay? So, what I always suggest if you're in your head, if you're out of state, instead of thinking, "Oh, how do I think my way back out of or how do I uh, what what's, what belief system do I need?" Instead I say go take one positive action. Go do one set in a way that you find fun or funny. Go do a set and force yourself to act as if you're the guy that's already like very entitled by speaking in a loud voice and being assertive and confident, right? And oftentimes what will happen is you'll do that, you'll get a good reaction, and all of a sudden that good reaction will put you in state, which is great. But even if you don't get that good reaction, the fact that you're focusing on what you're actually doing instead of in your head, it may not get you in state, but it will keep you from being massively out of state, right? So it will at least get you to a baseline level of good. Right? And that's one of the things that I really love about gaming the way I game in general, is I may not be always on. Like you can tell, like the guys that go out with me, they can tell when I'm on because I start doing this like silly little dance in club and stuff. Like it's 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 retarded. It looks lame as shit. But like you can tell, like I'll start like bouncing right when I'm really on. It's like oh fuck, Todd's in state now. Some good shit's gonna happen. <laughs> um, so that doesn't happen all the time. But my baseline minimum state is always at least not that bad, because if I do get in my head, I know how to take an action and put myself back in the present moment. So at the very least, I'm not hurting myself. I might not be always brilliant, but I'm never bad. Okay? So that's a way to, to kind of turn that one around. Um, and then the other one, the body language thing, obviously, if you're trying to correct body language, similar with the 25 points, instead of trying to correct, like, don't hold your arm like this, stop thinking about your fucking arm. Just go be confident. Right? It doesn't matter. Um, and lastly, what you can do to even amp that up more um, when you're talking about, like, getting out of your head through, through taking action, is take an action that doesn't have an outcome attached to it. Okay, so if you go in, if you're like, oh, my sets suck, this, uh, what's going on? I'm, why, why have I been in pickup for, in my case, why have I been in pickup for like 14 years and I'm having a bad night? I must be the most retarded human being on the planet. When you're thinking that, okay, go in and do a set and, and do it as be like the best you can in terms of like body language, physicality, um, tonality, all that kind of stuff. But on top of it, Try and make it fail. Try and actually fail. Right? Get rid of the idea of outcome completely. Right? And then all of a sudden, it usually cracks in. It's really, really weird. I give guys this assignment on boot camp um, when guys are really, really getting like, locked up. I say, go into the next set and you're not allowed to succeed. You are not allowed to succeed. If you go in and they start liking you, you have to do something retarded to make them not like you. And if that doesn't work, do something else retarded to make them not like you. And if it turns out they like retards, then start acting smart so you can piss them off. Right? Whatever it is, find a way to fail the fucking set. And apparently my students are all idiots because they fail at failing then. They fail at failing. They go in and they hold the set for 10 minutes like, what are you doing, bro? Why are you here? He's like, I'm like, no, fail. Right? Funny enough, they've been failing all night trying to succeed. As soon as they try and fail, all of a sudden they start succeeding. Because they started getting out of their own way. Okay, so that's what you really need to do uh, with respect to all that stuff. Um, but the other thing that you need in order to be dominant is you need motivation. You need some drive, some aggressiveness, right? Um, so we always talk about being outcome independent in set. Being outcome independent, not having an outcome, not like trying too hard for any particular thing. Well, that's great. That's wonderful. But if I was truly outcome independent in a club, what would my sets look like? Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> I don't care. I don't care if I get girls. I'm give a fuck. I'll just relax, right? True. If you were truly, truly outcome independent, you would literally take no action. That's the definition of outcome independent, right? Outcome independent means no motivation, and that's not good either, right? You have to be motivated. You have to be actually like bloodthirsty motivated. You have to be so. You have to be like I will kill to get this girl motivated, but at the same time completely okay with if, if it fails, completely okay with not getting her, right? And what that really means is you have to be, you have to want to do it, not for the outcome, but because you want to do it, okay? How many people in this room ever played sports growing up? Raise your hands. Cool, decent amount. So I played soccer growing up. I was actually a pretty serious soccer player. I um, played from the age of four till about the age of like 23. Um, decided at 10 I wanted to be a professional player and like, uh, my dad made me, once, as soon as he heard I want to be a professional player, instead of being like, oh, that's a cute dream, son, he's like, okay, here's how you do it. And he gave me this game plan and forced me to do it every single fucking day whether I wanted to or not. So I was a pretty serious soccer player. Um, and we would play, um, our, my, my high school team was really, really good. So we'd play, you know, like a state championship level and we'd be always, always competing. And we'd have some games that were really tough. And then we'd have some games that were just jokes. Like we'd have some schools that we'd go and we'd beat them like 15 nothing every year. And like our coach would be like, you have to pass 10 times before scoring, and we'd still score like at will. Like it was just unfucking believable. Like not even not even a fun game. And honestly, after those games, I would get back in the bus and go home, and I always felt like icky inside. I felt like gross inside, having like I felt like I just like kicked a dog or something like that. <laughs> like it wasn't cool. It wasn't what the sport was supposed to be, right? And I would feel the same way. Say that like I, I went out to a, like a club and I see some girl that's like just like beneath me and um, like drunk and incoherent and I like drag her home and have sex with her. I would feel icky about that. Like I'd be like that's like beneath me. You know what I mean? Um, whereas if I stepped up to like the hot girl that intimidates me, the one that like the one where like I'm I'm pretty damn good with not getting reactive to girls, but the one where like you look her in the eye. And just as you're staring her down, you can feel yourself, oh fuck, I'm about to crack, right? <laughs> that girl, if I step up to that girl and I, I throw my best game at her and you know, I'm, I'm doing what I can and she's giving me the blase and I, I, I hit at it, I hit at it and I, I maybe get through it, maybe I don't. And eventually I don't get the girl, but I did everything I could. I feel great about that set. I feel amazing about that set. Because for me, it's not about the result so much as it's about the process. Right? And I played to win and I did everything I could. And I know um, in my, my arrogant future projected mind that I will get girls like that in the future. And the fact that I step to her is one little, another brick in sort of the wall that I'm building of my game that's going to get me there. Okay? That's very, very critical as well. So it's important that you be extremely competitive. It's important that you motivate yourself and step up and do the hard things and even enjoy the hardness of them. But at the same time, not be outcome dependent. So that's what we're really looking for in game. Um, but if you're gonna be truly assertive, you have to wanna fuck the girl. You have to really, really, really wanna fuck the girl. Jeff has this thing he says, he says he gets a boner in every set, All right? Even if you watch him, like, if you watch him break down his footage, he'll be like, there's times where like, the, the, the dialogue on the screen, he'll like, subtitle it, he, 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 and he'll be like, that's the sound of me getting hard, All right? <laughs> and I don't know if he's like, being serious or kidding, but he makes a good point, which is, that if you're not sexually aroused in set, what the fuck are you doing, right? What are you doing if you're not sexually aroused by the girl? If you're not sexually aroused by the girl you're talking to, do one of two things. Either step up to a hotter girl or change your focus, right? A lot of guys will, a lot of guys actually will be able to, this is, I don't, I don't want to make anybody raise hands on this, but this is a very common, like more common than you would think. Guy goes out, gets good at game, he can get sevens and eights, and actually like gets to the point where he can have sex with sevens and eights pretty regularly. Then finally he pulls a girl that he considers like a 9.5 or a 10. Gets her home and he can't get hard. Right? It happens. I'm, I've seen odds. I'm not going to point anybody out. But because uh, nobody wants to hear about ED, ED stories. But like the fact of the matter is it, it, it kind of doesn't make sense. It kind of doesn't make sense. But it kind of does. Because for a lot of guys when you get this like identity where it's like I'm the guy who can get 7s and 8s but not the guy who can get 9s and 10s. Then you look at those nines and tens not as sexual objects, but as sort of like these alien beings that bring validation, right? You view them not as like women, but as like these like beautiful creatures, right? And you think to yourself, oh, if I could get one of them, it would prove that I'm good at game. It would prove that all that effort was worth it. It would prove that I'm a worthwhile man. And now when you get there to the bedroom, you're not thinking sexy thoughts. You're not thinking, oh, fuck, I want, I want to fuck this girl. 
You're thinking, oh God, I'm finally validation, I'm finally an okay man. And now instead of being in the moment and like getting your dick hard, you're thinking about your past and your future and you're reminiscing like what is the significance of this moment to like my life, right? <laughs> <laughs> and in that moment, yeah, you're not getting hard. There's too much fucking thinking going on, right? Um, so you need to view the interaction as you want sex. You need to be a little horny. You need to want the girl for the right reason, right? There's a lot of, a lot of like sort of um, jargon and teaching in the pickup industry about like being outcome independent, not being too reactive, not, not showing too much intent, not giving your power away. Well, the funny thing is you can show a ton of intent. You can tell the girl you fucking love her. You can tell the girl she's so, so, so hot as long as it's coming from the right place, right? It's when it's coming from the wrong place that it's a problem. There's a guy we know out here in LA, um, actually uh, works, for, works for RSD, he's not a coach, but he's worked with the company for like, I don't know, 12 years or something like that. Um, and he has some of the best like stripper game of anybody. And his stripper game is he just compliments the fuck out of them, right? Which is the opposite of what everybody teaches you to do for strippers. Everybody teaches you to like devalidate them, get out of their stripper role, whatever. He's just like, you're so pretty. God, you're so fucking hot. Oh, I love you. Oh, I just want to, I, I would fucking love to kiss you so much, right? Just showing that intent. And it actually works for him. It actually works for him. It, I'm, I'm shocked. I'm shocked that it works for him, but it does over and over and over again. And the reason it works is because he's not looking at that stripper as a sex symbol. He's not looking at that stripper as a source of validation. He's looking at that stripper as a hot vagina he wants to fuck. That's it. That's how he's looking at her, right? Um, and so because of that, it's not this like, let me use you for something or let me gain validation from you, or let me like become more of a man by sleeping with you, it's let's fuck. I like sex, you like sex, let's fuck. All right? Another guy is, uh, you guys may have heard of like Evil Stifler. You guys heard this, th this guy? Yeah? For anybody who hasn't, this is a guy just roughly off the top of my head. Um, generally unemployed, he has like odd jobs here and there. Um, doesn't really believe much in hygiene or condoms or toothbrushing or showers. He thinks the internet is voodoo. Um, and he slept with upwards of 700 women as of the last count I've heard. Yeah, I, I, hear, the, I hear the gasps. And yeah, you should gasp. You should gasp a little bit. Think to yourself real fast, quick, quick little inner game thoughts. How much better is a girl off by being with you than by being with that guy? Just a little bit, right? Just a little bit better off with you. If that doesn't help your inner game, I don't know what's going to. Right? <laughs> In any case, he has, a, he has a brother who's also very good with girls, who's a little bit more successful than him, and um, who they both know about game a little bit. And so Tyler asked his brother one time, um, so Evil Stifle, your brother, um, how does he justify that he's entitled for girls? How, in, in his mind, how is he entitled? How is he able to step up to a 10 and think he deserves her? And the answer is pretty telling. Um, Evil Stifler's brother, who we call Stifler, um, basically said, he doesn't think of it that way. That thought doesn't even enter his mind. He doesn't think of the concept that sex could be for validation. He doesn't think of the concept that somehow you're a different person for having fucked a hotter girl, or that it somehow identifies anything about you as a man. He just thinks, I have a penis, you have a vagina. Obviously, they were meant to go together. <laughs> That's his mindset. His mindset is, I believe in sex. I'm here, let's fuck, right? That's it, very fucking simple but he gets out of his own way, and he's a horny motherfucker, right? So that's what he is, he's horny and gets out of his own way, and yes, he'll show tons of intent, tons and tons and tons of interest to the girl, but it's interest in the right way. It's not interest in a way of let me use you and get something from you, it's interest in the form of let's have fun. Let's do something that's gonna fucking make me come and make you come, and that'll be great, right? It's very simple, very direct, very, very, very straightforward. Uh, on topic? Well, it was about something you, know, you just touched on briefly, which was the you know, necklace that makes you Gucci. I like, how do you not, uh, how do you disqualify yourself as a boyfriend so you don't end up on a three day, you know, or like three day frame? Mm hmm. Do you want to hear a series of lines to disqualify me as a boyfriend? Yeah. I'll just off the top of my head. Let's see what I can come up with. Um, let's just have fun and let the grown ups handle the serious stuff. Um, Let's not, let's not make the sex tonight. I'm, I'm totally like, I totally think you're cute and everything, but just like, I'm just, I've had too many like 
too many meaningless one night stands. I just I'm not I'm not feeling it right now. Like if you want some other guy to fuck you, like go find him. It's fine. I just want to chat. Um, other things for boyfriends. Um, I'm not boyfriend material. Don't get any ideas. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm flying out early in the early this morning, so uh, you know there's nothing that you know can happen between us. Um, you're really cute, but you're not my type. Um, it was really nice meeting you. I think you're a wonderful person. I, I'm sure you'll meet a great guy one day. Um, I want you to know, like, I still think, you know, uh, I can even introduce you to my friends. It's totally fine. It might hurt a little bit, but it's, it's okay. Um, I want you to know you look great. It has nothing to do with your love handles. This is fine. <laughs> um, let's see, what else, what else, what else? Uh, what else do they disqualify the boyfriend thing? Um, uh, I'll even say, like, things like, uh, I know I've been fooling around with you. Like I've been joking around a lot. Can I can I be real, can I be serious with you for a second? Haha, <laughs> you think I can be serious? That's funny. <laughs> you just fuck around, right? Any of these things, any of these things that are just like don't give a fuck, don't care, whatever that sort of thing. Um, another one is um, if when they ask you questions about yourself, you don't explicitly answer them, right? Fucking around with the answers instead of giving real answers. Where are you from? If I say Colorado, if I say, oh, I was born and raised in a small town in Colorado and I moved here and then I went to college here and then that's a fucking boyfriend frame answer. Where are you from? Heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you from? All the fucking questions you could ask me, that's what you asked. Really? Seriously? You, you don't know how to be fun in a club? Get the fuck out of my face. <laughs> right? Right? All these kind of things are projecting value without comfort. Value, no comfort. Um, so those are all things that will, uh, will disabuse the boyfriend frame. Right, the other thing you can do is if they ever bring up um, ideas of dating or whatever, you can be like, whoa, 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 no, 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 right? Or you can even misinterpret. Like if she's like, I love, you'd be like, oh, shit, no, 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 no. It's too early, too early for love. Like that's, well, first of all, too early, and secondly, I don't even know if I believe in that shit. So let's, let's, let's just calm it down, right? All these things play into the frame of player, not boyfriend, right? Um, the other thing you can do is be like very like douchey asshole, whatever. Um, for example, on my, these are good ones, on my online profiles, past and present, um, some of the ones that I will put, uh, there's a Hank Moody line that says, I believe, or I've come to realize that a morning of awkwardness is better than a night of loneliness. All right? Um, that one's pretty effective. Um, there's another one, I don't remember who this one's from. They say, um, my, view on a wife, uh, no, my view on a wife at 40 is like a banknote. I feel you should be able to trade it in for 220s. <laughs> So like all these like extremely like arrogant, arrogant, like sort of like almost sexist, almost like extremely playerish types of lines and attitudes. Um, another one is um, uh, Ryan in one of his videos um, for the original Hot Seat One. He's asked like, do I like where 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 does your girlfriend live or something like that? Um, and she he goes uh, New York, L.A. and Texas. <laughs> all right, and then he goes into this lo lengthy tirade, probably like like seven or eight minute like lengthy tirade breaking down his relationship with like five different girls he's dating and just explaining that like that's the life he leads. That's another way to very much not convey the boyfriend frame. Um, so all those kind of things. I mean, you kind of get the idea I think at this point. Um, okay, on topic? Yeah, something we touched on earlier. Cool. Okay. Um, the threat versus value, like becoming relevant to the hot girl in the club. Um, is that mostly due to like what Owen refers to as situational confidence? She's got a lot of power in that setting, so she doesn't really take you seriously. Whereas maybe if you were to approach her on the street during the day, you'd be like, holy shit, this is happening, and then you're relevant a lot easier. That's possibly true. It's possibly true, although there are girls that basically their whole life has been um, a series of men validating them. So their situational confidence pretty much extends to every situation, All right? So there's that. Um, there's an interesting phrase um, that I heard, which is, uh, we call it the magic school bus. It's like the world of a 10. Um, you guys ever see those like children's like books where it's like the like Miss Frizzle and the magic school bus goes inside the human body, it goes into outer space, All right? And what is like the experience of like, imagine being a kid on the magic school bus. All right, you're in this little school bus, you're going through like the wonders of the world, you're seeing like the most amazing fucking shit. You have to do nothing, you just sit back and relax and enjoy, and you're totally safe, right? That's kind of the world and like nothing bad can happen to you. 
That's like the world of a hot girl. Right? That's like the world of a hot girl. Um, and, and actually, that's the world of a hot girl until the moment it's not. It's the world of a hot girl until she fucks it up. Right? It's the world of a hot girl until she like overdoses on heroin, or until she like gets in like a motorcycle accident, or until she like um, yeah gets pregnant from the wrong guy or whatever the fuck. Right? But that's 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 her life until the moment it's not. But as long as she is still that hot, high value girl that you're actually after, that pretty much has been her life. And so, um, it's it's kind of difficult to outframe that because it's been reinforced so 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 many times over and over and over again. Um, and also, it's a really nice place. Like if you have a great frame, if you have a, a frame of life that's like, I'm amazing, life's amazing, I get all these like shiny things thrown at me. Like you want an example? Um, the girl, the same girl from the, the improv class, uh, the improv class pickup that I mentioned earlier. This girl, we, we dated for about three months and then we became friends for almost, like I wanna say almost two years afterwards. In any case, um, she is something of a public figure, um, i.e. like very minor celebrity. And um, she got a care package from a fan of hers that involved, uh, and this is someone who she has never met, does not know, um, will never meet. He just like sent it just because. Just because. Sent her two pairs of shoes. I believe the total net value of the two pairs of shoes was something like $1,900. And then a uh, Nintendo Wii and like four or five games for the Wii. Just because. She just went to her little like fan mailbox and showed up one day and it was just sitting there for her. Okay? This is the world of a hot girl. This is the fucking magic school bus. Um, and the point is, I mean, good for them. Like, let, let's be honest. If you had that in your life, would you want to give that up? I'd be like, fuck yeah, give me the, give me the shoes and the Wii and it's fucking amazing. Um, but that's, that's their frame. And so it does take a little bit to knock them out of it and they don't want to be knocked out of it. Except... On a certain level, they do. On a certain level, they do because in a weird way, really, really attractive girls, they are extremely secure to a point. They're extremely secure in the fact that they know they're attractive because they've been told it over and over and over and over again. But they're extremely insecure because they know they didn't earn it. They didn't earn their attractiveness. They know that their attractiveness was an accident. Right? It just happened. I mean, some of them maybe got plastic surgery, so I guess they earned it, right? Or at least to an extent they did. But even they know that it's going away. They know that there will be a point where their attractiveness will fade, and when that attractiveness fades, they know that they have not built the requisite skills behind it to continue living the way they do, all right? So there's this like sick desperation to the way they live. They're on the, they, I think of it almost like, a, like professional athlete years. It's like a professional football player, right? You're like superstar for a short period of time and then like your average career span is like two to three years and then you have some career ending injury and you're done, right? That's what it is for like a hot girl. It's like a hot girl is like, they have like their 10 year span where they are like on top of the world, where they're essentially like being treated like a professional athlete, right? They do very little, make appearances, get paid a lot of fucking money um, and then at some point it's just over. And when it's over, their whole life goes to shit by comparison, by comparison. And so they have this window to like meet some guy that will sustain that life for the long run. But the problem is that number one, if they meet that guy, they're completely dependent on that guy so they feel helpless. And number two, the type of guy that they really want to be with, as soon as they cross that threshold, can probably get another girl that is the girl they used to be before they cross that threshold. So it's not exactly the easiest situation for them. And so th there is a lot of desperation. To make it worse, a lot of them work in industries that are hot girl industries. And when you go to, go to like hot girl industries, if you get pretty high up in those industries, you're competing with a lot of really hot girls that are very similar to yourself. So um, again, from the same girl, um, one thing that she uh, really hated, she's an actress, um, was, it was she a model actress, um, was these auditions she called cattle calls. And what a cattle call is basically, by the way, if you ever want to like get in with like a certain type of girl, like if you want to date models, learn the vocabulary of models. Learn like the vocabulary, like you want to date actresses, learn the vocabulary of actresses. You want to date strippers, learn their vocabulary. Because then when you speak their vocabulary, it says to them, you understand their world and you've dated girls like them before. So it actually makes a difference. But so anyway, she called these things cattle calls. And what it basically means is there's a type. They're, say, they're looking for like, um, like brunette or redhead um, between like 5'2 and 5'5 five five with like curvy athletic body in a swimsuit that is red. 
or something like that. That's what they're, that's what they're like for looking. The edit that is read isn't, isn't relevant, but that's what they're looking for up to that point. So she goes to this audition and she literally sees herself <laughs> replicated 200 times and thinks there is nothing special about me. And every single thing about her that's a potential flaw relative to some other girl, she gets insecure about. So she has like fucking like the most amazing abs and like crazy legs, but then has like her calves are a little bit like small or whatever. She's like, damn it, my calves suck. Like I'm so ugly, I'm so ugly. And she'll like, especially if she doesn't get the role, which most of the time they don't, like there's a hundred girls going for like two or three roles. Most of the time she doesn't, she goes home and cries and thinks she's ugly, right? So on the one hand, they are very, very confident. On the other hand, it's this very sort of like, insubstantial, unsubstantial, I don't know. Very like a confidence that's not based on anything. So it can be eroded very quickly. And what they really, really want is some kind of leadership and guidance in their life where they can have a life where they are secure and happy without having to be terrified all the time and without having to worry about it going away. And for that, like a good strong male leader is one of the best things they can have. And that's what you can provide for them.